that. Um, it is a process that we started uh, when we uh, worked towards our uh, Durban Congress in 2019, and we're happy to say that it has been a very important pillar of the work that we have done with the uh, civil society um, internationally. It has allowed us in these years of um, of the special context of COVID to work online uh, with many partners um, and to produce very interesting content that uh, you can find in our interactive platform, uh, Cities Are Listening. The objective of this space that we have opened up is to build on our legacy working towards um, the SDG agenda, towards the Habitat 3 agenda, but also the global agenda such as the Paris Agreement, um, to ensure that the messages of the organized constituency of local and regional governments also included the visions, the needs, the ambitions, and the hopes of, um, of communities from around the world and that we try to influence each other, the vision of a sphere of government, but also that of communities. This is what we call the town halls. The town halls are open processes um, and uh, they are usually led by, um, by organizations that have been working with us, that, that we trust, and that have a broad and legitimate representation of different, of different groups. While the first town halls that we worked uh, around were town halls that were very thematic and sectorial, um, we feel that we are mature enough and that we have come far enough now to actually try to think um, around more complex issues, uh, if, if you want, um, issues that uh, we need to define together, that we need to co-create issues like um, the commons. What are the, what, what are the new commons that need to define new service provisions, uh, the, the new essentials? What are caring systems? How do we uh, ensure that the future service provision um, is organized around care? How, we, how can we go from the model of society that we have now to a model of society where care is at the center of, of what we do. Um, we, all, we have also been discussing the issue of trust, trust and government. Uh, how can we redefine the governance models uh, and what role does trust play in this and how can we address some of the democratic deficits that, that we are facing? And in, in these important um, discussions, we felt it was also very relevant to address one of the greatest uh, uh, challenges and emergencies that humanity is facing, and that is that of, of climate, climate change. Um, how do we relate to our planet? Uh, what, how do the models of consumption and production need to change to, in order to make it sustainable? Is this about survival or is it about more than survival? Is it actually about quality of life, understanding development and progress in a different manner? And that's why we made the choice with, um, with many ideas and inputs from friends to link the issue of climate with culture because the battle will be won or lost if it is dealt with at local level, but we also feel that the role of culture needs to be different in this discussion. And it is something that our constituency has been saying for a very long time. Um, we have been calling for a, uh, for a sustainable development goal on culture. And we have also been calling for culture to be understood as the fourth uh, pillar of development. I think the discussions that we are going to have here today and the, and the exciting work that has been done by the Climate Heritage uh, Network and, 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 and that is leading this town hall um, can be really interesting. But also all the rest of the partners that are going to be introduced here in a moment. I think we need to start thinking differently about um, how to address the climate emergency. And we feel that culture 
that local governance and communities need to play a very important role because they will probably that will probably define a new social contract that we think needs to guide the new uh, phase of the international municipal movement. We have been mandated by our uh, political leadership to define a pact for the future. That will be the red thread that we need to feed into the work of our world organization in the future. A pact for the future around people, planet, and government, where transforming the relationships within those different axes will be uh, very critical. So what we expect from this town hall is to provide inputs to that pact, to inspire the work that we do as, as networks with our stakeholders, and to find its way into the policy making and the work program of the organization um, that will be defined this year in the John in our triennial Congress. So as I always say to the town halls, no pressure, but we are expecting a lot from you. <laughs> so in order to, um, to set the tone and, and to get a, a picture, because many of you have not been in the other meetings, um, I am going to invite uh, Jean-Baptiste Buffet from our policy team, the coordinator of our policy team and the World Secretariat, um, to present to you the town hall process. Then we will go to the leading organization and Andrew Potts is going to present to us some of his thoughts on how they are looking at this conversation. Then we will have an inspiring um, uh, talk from our Ubuntu advisor, Aromar uh, Revy. Some provoking thoughts, he always is provocative uh, about things to consider. And then we will open up the floor to all the members of the town hall. So Jean-Baptiste, the floor is yours to quickly go through the process of the town. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Um, indeed, only, only a two, three minutes to, to either refresh your minds or either uh, for you to, to, to get acquainted with, with what we call the UCLG town hall process. Um, this is a journey that started actually before, just before the Durban Congress in 2019, with this idea of, of co-creating, right? Huh? This exercise of co-creation with our, with our uh, civil society partners. Um, in, this led us to, to, this, um, to, the, to the Durban Congress with um, very uh, important policy recommendations that we did all together and have, that have actually shaped uh, our, um, our, our policy work and our, our partnerships uh, with you and, and with the constituencies for, the, for those three years. So from Durban to until now. So what this process uh, is actually about, uh, about structuring our work, shaping our policy uh, recommendations uh, of our own organization and the work we do with you. Um, this has been actually materialized uh, also uh, in the Cities Are Listening uh, exercise that is still uh, active uh, and through uh, all the uh, pillars that, that, you've, uh, yeah, that you've seen uh, around, for example, accessibility, sustainable urban development, uh, informality, gender equality, etc. Um, this year, we are um, heading to Daijon, our World Congress in October, uh, with this renewed town hall uh, track exercise, focusing on those four themes that Emilia was just men mentioning. And climate and culture is one of those four pillars. Uh, we have already uh, been holding um, uh, the uh, Thinking Big meeting uh, on uh, trust and government, um, we are going to have one tomorrow on caring systems. Uh, we have been holding um, um, the uh, either um, the uh, the first one um, on um, the global commons. Uh, so these uh, town halls, uh, these four town halls, will be uh, actually influencing this policy work and producing policy recommendations uh, towards towards Daicha. Um, it's important to uh, mention um, that we are going to have a cross-cutting caucus, uh, caucuses uh, that are actually uh, present here. This is new from the first version, uh, so caucus on accessibility, caucus on youth, uh, caucus on, 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 on feminist movement. So these representatives have their own sittings, but they also come together 
when the thematic um, uh, the thematic town hall um, meets. Um, could you move? Yes, on the next slide. Um, just to for you to be uh, briefed on the on on this very um, on this very uh, climate and culture town hall. Uh, we have uh, we are very grateful for the Climate Heritage Network to be uh, to have accepted the leading organization role. Uh, we have also with us uh, Climate Chance and Senator Renaud Renaud on Tech, uh, the Global Alliance for the Right to Nature, the Indigenous People Major Group, uh, and the Making uh, Cities uh, Re Resilient uh, campaign. Uh, thank you, thank you all uh, for for being here. Um, so. Um, only a few uh, other um, other important uh, mentions before we we we, we get started. Uh, we've had a first launch of the of the town hall um, earlier uh, in January, where all the uh, all the uh, representatives were uh, could, could meet and 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 uh, define uh, how they see this process to West Asian. Uh, we will have. Uh, later uh, in February, a meeting uh, to uh, of of the of all the of the, all the town halls during the Resilgy retreat, uh, the week of the twenty first of February, where you are all uh, invited. Uh, later in in March April, uh, we want to uh, hold um, side visits and uh, side, side visits one per town hall to actually learn and, and inspire about cases. Uh, that are present among the cities and regions that we uh, that we work with, and uh, we uh, and we want to uh, also um, tell you that we will uh, we are constructing a space, virtual space, UCLG meets where all the consultations uh, will take place around those policy documents, where you can actually interact uh, within each other. So I think that gives you a little bit of uh, the scope and the, and the objectives, but also some of the modalities, uh, to interact. So having said that, we'll, we'll uh, remain here, the team available, uh, uh, during this meeting by chat, uh, if, if you have any other question, I think I'll stop here for, for now, Emilia and, and, uh, hand over back, back to you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jean Baptiste, and we will see whether in the uh, wrap up of the meeting uh, and, and defining new uh, step as next steps, uh, we need to provide additional information. But in any case, thank you for this concise presentation of the of the process. And let me go now to to Andrew, um, Andrew Potts uh, from the Climate Heritage uh, Network. Um, some thoughts, Andrew, on how you are looking at the work and, and the discussions within this town hall, and in particular about this choice that we have made about linking the climate discussion with culture. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Amelia, for that introduction. And nice to see everyone. Um, greetings from New York, where I'm sitting, where it's cold and snowy today. Uh, it's quite an honor for the Climate Heritage Network and for me personally to be given this, trusted with this assignment by Amelia and um, to have the privilege of working with all of you. I'm in awe of the talent and depth and background of each of you. So I Andrew, we're having some difficulties with your microphone. Um, I don't know what it is. Is there something that you could change? Because your, your sound comes and go a bit as you move. Ah, okay, let me check. Can, can you speak uh, for a little while and see yeah. whether we can solve that? Yeah. Is it any better now? It's much better actually, yes. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I, I was just saying what an honor it is to be able to go through this process with all of you. Um, maybe just very quickly a little bit about the Climate Heritage Network, the organization that I uh, represent. The CHN was founded in 2019 uh, with the mission of mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage for climate action, foregrounding the cultural dimensions of the climate emergency, and scaling out culture based solutions. The CHN is a diverse organization. We try to represent many facets of culture from fine arts, performance, music, literature, to uh, cultural uh, creative industries, to uh, sites, landscapes, monuments, archeology, 
um, museums, collections, libraries. Um, and so we try to be quite uh, transversal in the cultural sense. Um, it also has an eclectic membership. Uh, it includes units of government at all levels, uh, um, local, regional, but also national. It includes cultural institutions, of course, civil society, universities and research organizations, indigenous people's organizations, and also uh, business and creative industries. UCLG was a founding member of the CHN, so thank you for that, um, as well as many large uh, international cultural networks like the International Federation of Libraries, the International Council of Museums, International Council of Monuments and Sites, but also many um, local and regional and frontline organizations. Uh, I, I want to just comment briefly on the observation Amelia made about the pathway that took you, UCLG, to the point of choosing to make culture and climate one of the uh, priorities for this uh, town hall process. I, I really do think that uh, choice was inspired. And I think that because I firmly believe in my heart that there is no pathway to holding global warming to 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels, no pathway to 1.5 degrees, no pathway to two degrees even, that does not include culture. And this is not only my view, but the IPCC's view. If you read their 2018 uh, special report on 1.5 degrees of warming, it says that culture is an enabling condition for transformative climate action. And so the role of culture is central, existential to tackling the climate emergency. It, it says in the brief for this town hall that our remit is to cover the relationship between climate and culture and to focus on the social side of the climate crisis. And, and that is exactly what we need to do. That is exactly what is critical. The, at the Climate Heritage Network, we sometimes say that anthropogenic problems need anthropogenic solutions, they need human solutions. And that is what we in culture bring. And so it's really inspiring and exhilarating to be a part of this process. At the same time, it's a little bit daunting. Uh, daunting because uh, in my experience at least, there is a culture-sized hole in global climate policy making and global climate planning. And so it's ironic that a, a dimension, the cultural dimension, that is an enabling condition of transformative change, that is existential to tackling the climate crisis, is not sufficiently represented in those processes. I, I don't know how many of you were in Izmir at the UCLG Culture Summit uh, this past September. If you were there, you heard the keynote speech from Mayor Sawyer, Quinch uh, Sawyer, uh, the mayor of Izmir. And he said something in his remarks that was uh, so um, interesting to me. He, he said that economy without culture is what has given us climate change. And so I, I think that that is a, a remarkable uh, a place to, to start in thinking about what we have before us. And, and I would just add to what Mayor Sawyer said, that if economy without culture has given us climate change, then what is climate planning and climate action without culture? What, what will that give us? I, 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 like maybe some of you, I spent most of November in Glasgow in Scotland at COP26, and we had a little bit of a glimpse there of what climate planning without culture looks like. The, the COP processes, international climate policy making in general, in, in my experiences, is really prioritized by this focus on technological solutions, on market solutions. There is um, um, a tendency to avoid the uncertain, the contested, to overlook the social and political, ethical, let us say culture and heritage dimensions of the climate process. And that plays out in big ways and little ways. I mean, at COP26, if you were in Glasgow, food day, on food day was about GMO crops, it was about laboratory grown meat, but they could not agree to include the word agroecology in the Coronivia work plan on climate smart agriculture. Transport day was about electric vehicles, great, but almost no mention of territorial planning and historic settlement patterns that give us walkable, cyclable cities. 
buildings they viewed the existing built environment, including the historic built environment, as a problem that had to be fixed by uh, technological innovation and not as a vast invested resource of carbon and, of, and the crucible of creativity and of community. And so we see what climate planning without culture gives us. And to be provocative, I might say, what climate planning without culture gives us is three degrees of global warming, because that's the path we're still on, despite a decade of concerted effort and six years now under the Paris Agreement regime. And so um, I, I do think it's inspiring and daunting to have this mandate to look at the um, social and cultural dimensions of the climate emergency. I wanna just mention two other topics quickly in, in the last minute or so I have that, that I think to, to me would be interesting to try to take account of in our deliberations in the town hall process. Uh, the first is this, uh, you know, I've just said that I think culture has been largely missing from international climate planning. Uh, let's say you agree with that. It, it still begs the question, why? Why would that be so? And I think this is something that we have to get to the bottom of in our processes. Uh, there's actually been studies of this topic. One, one argument is that culture and, and uh, heritage processes are qualitative, whereas climate action planning demands quantitative uh, processes. And so that's a theory. Uh, I have another theory uh, that I'll mention in 30 seconds. And that is the complexity of the intersection of culture and climate, because culture is part of the solution to climate change, of course, social cohesion, traditional knowledge. Uh, I could go on and on, and, and we'll talk about all these dimensions, I hope. But culture is also a part of the problem of climate change, at least in the industrialized nations. It has been an extractive, take, make, waste, consumptive approach to society that has given us climate change. And we've been living with that for hundreds of years now. It's not a recent phenomenon. We've been at the Industrial Revolution for 200 years. And so in many places, like in New York, where I live, environmental humanities calls what we have a petroculture. And it calls our sort of sprawling, very urban cities uh, petroscapes. And so this is part of the problem of climate change. And so how do we that study and work with culture and heritage, how do we distinguish between the elements of culture and heritage that are part of the solution and the elements that are part of the problem? And, and I think that is something we will need to look at. And it's, it takes me to the last point that I wanted to make. And it, that is this question of trade-offs and synergies. We, the, the very premise that culture is part of the problem of climate change leads us to the point that there's not all dimensions of culture and heritage do we want to perpetuate and celebrate in this situation. And we see already conflicts between climate action and culture. And it tends to manifest itself in in uh, flashpoints like putting solar panels on historic uh, buildings, erecting wind farms in cultural landscapes. But also what about um, say the loss of multi-generational multi livelihoods in coal communities or, uh, or in uh, regions like in the United States dependent on, on uh, petroleum. Even uh, tourism intensive uh, communities because we know that we can't have the same model of carbon intensive tourism that we will have. So what about the culture and heritage related to these points? And what are the analyses and the frameworks that will allow us to address these synergies and trade-offs, just transition, what the UN prosaically calls response measures? I think that um, is important too. And so I, I think I will conclude with that. Um, but there was a provocative article uh, released just before uh, COP26 by Kevin Stoddard and he said that the reason we haven't been able to bend the emissions curve enough and get on the path to 1.5 is that we fundamentally lack the ability to imagine what a post-carbon society looks like. The, the, what a society that's not extracted in terms of resources and people, uh, what can that look like? He said, we need people that can help us imagine that future. And I think that we in culture are the people to help with that. And I, Delighted to be a part of this process. Uh, thank you, Amelia. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I think that is a very, very, very interesting question that you're posing there. Um, I mean, how can we imagine? And I don't know. Um, I don't know if uh, this group is able to imagine, but I, I we certainly need to acknowledge the task 
that we do need to imagine that that future. And imagining that, that future also entails imagining new relationships among ourselves, real, new relationships with government, but also new relationships with, with the planet. You have brought up many interesting issues, so I will not bring them up again, but I think um, the part of trade off is something that we will need to discuss. In this time when uh, political leadership is, is asking um, populations uh, to do sacrifices, we will also need to uh, start understanding that some of the things that we nowadays consider sacrifices might not be sacrifices at the, at the long term. They are just changes in the way that, that we approach uh, things, but a very interesting basis for discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I'm sure it will come back with many of the of the members of, of this uh, group eh, with the Global Alliance for the Rights of Humanity with God Corinne Lepage with us, uh, the president of Climate Chance, uh, Ronald Antec, uh, coming from um, elected leadership uh, at city level and trying to gather all the stakeholders um, behind us, but also we don't have them with us today, but they will be with us in the process, the Inter International Indigenous uh, Women uh, uh, Forum, which I, I think has a very different type of relationship uh, with nature and, 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 and heritage than some of the, of the more uh, toxic relationships that we have seen in the in the in the past so it will be very interesting to hear from them all in all we've got a great group to do that thinking and let us go now to uh to aromar aromar revi the director of the indian institute for human settlements uh, aromar you are in many of our processes as ubuntu advisor but also um, shaping international policy in in, in your different uh, capacities um we look forward to hearing from you and thank you very much for uh for inspiring us and, and for um uh, walking this path with us welcome thanks amelia <clears throat> actually i'll just pick up on where andrew left off and in, in the question of imaginaries see the imaginary of climate or at least climate action at the moment because i kind of helped write that 1.5 report and we when we said that in a sense societal transformation <clears throat> or particularly uh, culture as a key kind of driving force is, is very important. And the, the current imaginary is kind of very simple. It's focused on self-interest. It's focused on competition and efficiency. It's focused on carbon prices. It's focused on carbon targets. It's focused very much on the biophysical reality we deal with. But in actual fact, the core drivers behind all of this our particular views of the world and of development and what is really worth uh, while doing, what is worth while living and otherwise. So I think uh, centrally the crisis, our inability to deal now 30 years on since Rio with the climate crisis is precisely because we do not engage with some very simple core questions which every citizen has to deal with. We have to change our way of cooking, of eating, of drinking, of, of what we wear, how we travel. Uh, in sort of individual terms and very much uh, collectively. But before that, I think there's, you know, there's a challenge as, as all good sort of alcoholics and drug addicts uh, know very well, we have to first embrace the challenge, which is ourselves. I mean, the first and most important thing is to accept that the climate emergency or climate change is a fact. It's happening. And, you know, those of us <clears throat> who work on climate science, like I do, uh, the situation is actually getting worse. In fact, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. So the first thing is just embracing uh, the fact that this is this is happening and it's going to get much worse. The second thing, of course, which is a tough part, and this is where I think you know um, the cultural element is absolutely central, is that we need to take responsibility for what we've done. I mean, this is something we've created ourselves. It's, it's our social choices, our choices of forms of consumption, of forms of development, of forms of accumulation of capital of inequality uh, have created the world that we're in. So, you know, we've done that uh, individually and collectively through the choices we've made. And that has affected the health of the planet, uh, the health and well being of people across the world. In fact, a lot of people um, are kind of suffering and will suffer who've absolutely had nothing to do with this process. So, that's the second thing to sort of 
basically uh, embrace our responsibility and also something else that we don't often want to accept and that is that it doesn't matter where we are in the world today unfortunately because we're at 1.1 degrees and 1.5 is pretty much around the corner you know we'll see that in the next decade or so it's not far off all of us are not only responsible are going to be impacted it doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor irrespective of your gender or your you know identity we're all going to be impacted by it and the funny thing, and we had said this a long time ago in 2014, as far as cities are concerned, it really doesn't matter if we continue along, you know, the NDCs, which are basically, a, you know, the fast elevator to 2.7 or 3 degrees temperature elevation. That's what the NDCs are, what we agreed in Paris, are take, going to take us to closer to 3. Uh, it doesn't matter when you're getting uh, closer to 2.7 or 3 degrees elevation, whether you're in New York or in London or Dar es Salaam or in Mumbai, uh basically our ecosystem services are going to collapse uh, and you know it may be a difference of 10 years because you've got the thames barrier or you've got a wonderful uh, technical system or you have a little bit more resources but eventually once agriculture once water and, and a whole range of basic things which support our cities start falling apart um it doesn't really matter it's a question of time you know there's a great equalization that we'll see so that's the other thing that's kind of uh, sort of important for us to deal with so what do we do about it? I guess the critical thing is to accept that we have to act individually and collectively at many levels of aggregation together. And we don't have the opportunity, which a lot of people have tried to tell us for many, many, many years to trade off energy versus food versus water versus inequality. We have to do all of that together, which in some senses is a message of the SDGs. If you really pick up the sort of inherent core uh, thing that was negotiated at the at, at the General Assembly, which is leave no one behind, leave no place behind, and leave no ecosystem behind. When you read all of them together, it basically means that we have to individually and collectively act now. Because if we don't act now, the implications that we're going to have is not, you know, a few million people here and there being distressed. It's going to actually impact hundreds of millions of people. And if we go up to 2.5 or 2.7, it's going to involve many, many, <laughs> much larger numbers of people as far as that's concerned. So basically, the key thing is it's about choice, right? And what is the best place in which choice is really exposed in our societies? It isn't necessarily in the science or the technology, maybe not even in the history. It is actually most effectively done, I think, in every culture that I've seen uh, around very simple thing. It's, it's, it's in our mythology. This, in a sense, is the classic challenge. Uh, whether you see it in Gilgamesh or you know in a great drought or whatever it is, in every mythical system you see, it doesn't matter, 5,000 years ago, whether it's in East Asia or in Africa or Latin America, this is the human condition. How do you deal with a very deep existentialist crisis? How do you step away from your normal world, which you're used to? How do you go into the underworld if you're Persephone in, in the Greek tradition or Savitri in, in sort of the Indian tradition? How do you find and confront the deepest, darkest secrets uh, and the assumptions in which our society and culture is based on, the inequality that it's constructed on, how do you then overcome them in yourself? Because it's not only about the collective, it's also about the individual. And then how do you return uh, into the world and bringing that gift of new light and new ways of doing? I mean, this is a classic story. You find it pretty much everywhere. And you find it, of course, in art, the theater, literature, music, and our buildings. But I think that is the power that we have to reach into. And I think that is the power that local governments could have. Uh, you know, in, our, in, our, in, in India, we have a, you know, an old sort of um, mythical story or whatever it is, it may be a religious story for some people. It's called the Ramayana. And the Ramayana is in a sense about the mythical fight between you know, light and darkness and whatever it is, has, has many characters inside it. Uh, but the interesting thing is the reason why it's, it is still being active and alive is, it is performed every year in tens or I would say hundreds of thousands of places. And I think that is, for me, the success of the bringing together of, 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 the, of culture and climate. If we are in you know, a thousand places across the world in the next three or four years, able to enact, to be able to play out, to see art and culture and music speak to the question. And it's not a new question, it's a very old question. As I said, you go back, go back to Gilgamesh, you find the same story. The story of the flood is found in pretty much every culture. Those are the kind of challenges that we have to deal with in very concrete terms 
as climate impact is going to hit us. So I think that is a real opportunity for us to be able to allow um, you know, the arts, to allow music, to allow uh, poetry, to allow theater, to allow film, to be able to capture these things in our context because the challenge of climate, and, and that's why it's so different from things in the past, and the same thing with the biodiversity crises, is, it's both universal. So it, you know, we basically treated our, the atmosphere as a sewer. So it's universal, it's right across the entire global system, but the responses have to be local and grounded. So like in the Ramayana or like in every other great tradition, you will have a wonderful story that's told in a hundred places, but the local telling will be different, but it will add up to the same story in some senses as far as uh, you know, both humanity is concerned, but also in our own context. And I think when that starts to happen and you know, we see younger people trying to embrace this in, in different ways, that's when we will really start seeing an upsurge of the commitment that people make, which will then push a whole range of other actors, whether it's you know, countries or it's firms or a whole range of other actors to saying, look, you know, the narrative has changed. We're, we're on the wrong side of this story. And maybe it's time for us to cross to the other side and make that shift both individually and collectively. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks, Emilia. Well, that's a lot to leave us with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aramar. Uh, as, as always, um, indeed, uh, very inspiring. And you have brought this issue about taking responsibility for what we have done. And I think also as, as a, a sphere of government uh, that we represent in United Cities and local governments, we, we need to come to terms and to realize that finding this balance between the needs of current generations and, and that of future generations will be very critical right for us now as 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 as, as the political leaders that that we represent and that the political space that we are trying to preserve and that is coming up in these discussions of the of the town halls um are directly linked with uh with those future generations is the beyond us that we need to look at as well. And I think here is where this imaginary, this culture and, um, needs to play also a very important role to, to help us overcome some of the, of the hurdles and the limitations that we see ourselves when we don't imagine the future and we just try to think very short term. So thank you for these words. Um, and I am now going back to Andrew. Andrew, we are all yours. Uh, we're in your hands. Um, this is the, is the moment to give the floor to, uh, to the other partners that are going to be accompanying uh, us in, this, in these deliberations. Um, back to you. Good luck with that, so Andrew. Well, th thank you, Amelia, and, and also, I want to thank you for those um, inspiring and provocative words as well. So this is an exciting part of the program where we're going to get to hear from the town hall members and the caucus members who will, um, who will be leading this process forward. I, I'm, I'm really excited to get to know each of you. If I understand well, we have seven speakers, uh, the five that are listed in the program, and we've been able to add two more, uh, Sir and Hannah and um, Victor. Um, and so seven speakers in one hour. Um, I'm going to follow the order in the program, starting with Ronan and then We'll finish with um, Sam, Hannah, and then Victor. Um, I think the uh, request is that each of the speakers introduce themselves and in that process answer the question, why is it relevant to talk about climate and culture in the current international context? What are the major trends that characterize this topic? And so to, to, to begin our uh, tour de table, uh, let me uh, hand the floor to Rona Dantek, president of Climate Chance. Uh, Ronan, are you with us? Yes, yes. Uh, ah, thank perfect. you, Andrew. You, you listen to me? It's yes. okay? I hear you well. Uh, uh, I, I see that it is uh, the last uh, day to wish you a uh, happy new year. Happy new year. Um, and uh, of course, I continue uh, in French because it's very important to, to save the uh, diversity, um, and uh, now I speak French. Uh, merci pour la pour l'invitation. Uh, le sujet que vous abordez est quand même un sujet extrêmement extrêmement vaste, uh, vraiment 
très, très important. Euh, et c'est vrai qu'il est, il est possible de, très vite de se, de se perdre euh, entre des sujets très, très locaux liés à la culture et un sujet plus, plus global. Mais je, je crois quand même que nous sommes tout à fait dans le rôle de ces GLU euh, d'explorer de, de nouveaux concepts sur cette question du climat, de sortir, et ça a été dit euh, par vous en introduction, d'une approche qui soit une approche trop, trop technique euh, de, de ces questions. Et c'est vrai qu'avec Emilia, avec d'autres ici, j'étais le, le porte-parole climat de ces GLU pendant des années, on a souvent eu une approche très technique sur l'accès au financement, sur la mutation énergétique. Alors, je crois qu'on est en train de vivre un autre moment. Le, le, le lien est fait entre climat et culture, mais peut-être que d'ores et déjà, cette crise climatique est dépassée par une crise plus globale qui est une crise de finitude de la planète. C'est-à-dire que Bien sûr, le, le changement climatique, le réchauffement climatique est extrêmement grave. Nous en sommes tous ici convaincus. Mais ces dernières années, nous avons vu aussi monter euh, l'effondrement de la biodiversité. Nous voyons monter, et ça va être un sujet considérable des prochaines années, la réduction des disponibilités de ressources naturelles, y compris sur des, des produits euh, comme la bauxite, comme... Euh, beaucoup de, évidemment, les, les métaux rares, donc beaucoup euh, d'éléments nécessaires euh, au fonctionnement de nos sociétés. Et je crois que derrière la question que vous posez du lien climat-culture, euh, je crois qu'il faudrait peut-être d'ores et déjà se situer plutôt dans une question de finitude de la planète et culture, dont la crise climatique est évidemment une des grandes crises, mais n'est pas la seule. Euh, et, et je crois que le, le premier travail théorique que nous avons à faire, c'est peut-être d'aller vers une description, une alerte sur une crise plus globale que la simple crise climatique, ce qui n'empêche pas, évidemment, la, la gravité de cette crise climatique en, en elle-même. Donc, à partir de là, je, je crois qu'on a, on a plusieurs questions. La, la première, c'est quand même de réinterroger notre socle culturel commun planétaire, mondial, euh, c'est qu'est-ce qui fait que nous agissons euh, sur, le, euh, sur le climat, non seulement pour nous, mais pour l'ensemble des habitants de cette planète. Ça, ce point me semble un point extrêmement important. Euh, alors là, je vous ai, non, ça y est, je vous ai retrouvé. Euh, un point extrêmement important euh, aujourd'hui, je crois que dans une approche culturelle, la première chose que nous devons faire, c'est de réinterroger effectivement cette, cette culture euh, collective de la responsabilité. Sortir y compris, euh, je vais y revenir juste après, de, du concept de responsabilité commune mais différenciée qui a longtemps guidé euh, les négociations sur le climat entre pays riches et pays en développement, mais pour réinterroger finalement euh, ce qu'est une responsabilité euh, collective. Derrière ce point vient tout de suite, et je pense que c'est là que la, la question culturelle est la plus centrale, notre rapport à la consommation et au développement. Il est clair aujourd'hui que face à cette crise de finitude, euh, nous ne pouvons pas euh, continuer à avoir un modèle mondial de consommation aussi frénétique. Nous sommes obligés de rentrer dans une culture de sobriété et à l'échelle planétaire. Or, nous voyons bien que, euh, et ça a été quand même une victoire culturelle euh, occidentale, que le, le modèle qui s'impose à l'échelle du monde, euh, aujourd'hui, de développement, est un modèle quand même extrêmement fondé sur la consommation et que je crois que nous sommes obligés culturellement de réinterroger euh, ce modèle. Et je crois que CGLU est particulièrement bien placé pour le faire puisque CGLU, euh, organisation que je connais très bien, est une des rares organisations euh, de ce type où il y a à la fois les pays du Nord et les pays du Sud. Or, on sait très bien que si nous avons des gens du Nord euh, qui arrivent en disant euh, il faut de la sobriété et surtout la sobriété de ceux qui n'ont pas eu déjà accès euh, au modèle de consommation du Nord, ça ne peut pas passer. C'est culturellement impossible, justement. Donc, je crois que là, il y a un travail intellectuel, culturel à faire pour dire c'est quoi une sobriété partagée à l'échelle mondiale Parce que cette sobriété, elle est inéluctable aujourd'hui 
Euh, sinon, nous allons vers des crises de plus en plus graves. Et on sait très bien que les crises de compétition sur les matières premières, ça a un nom très simple, ça s'appelle la guerre. Donc, pour sortir de ça, il faut effectivement que nous mettions sur la table euh, culturellement cette question du partage de la sobriété sans que ça apparaisse aussi euh, pour les pays les plus développés comme un moyen de préserver leur mode de consommation vis-à-vis -vis de ceux qui n'y ont pas encore eu accès. Ça, je pense que culturellement, nous devons mener ce combat-là, qui est un peu un combat tabou, y compris des négociations sur le climat, où on voit bien que tout le, tout le débat euh, des, des grands émergents, c'est bien sur le, le maintien de leur capacité de développement, euh, et que donc, il faut aller obligatoirement sur ce débat. Donc ça, ça me semble très important euh, que nous interrogions ce modèle culturel de la consommation qui s'est imposé euh, au niveau mondial ces dernières décennies. Ensuite, à partir du moment où on a interrogé ce qui fait notre sens commun à l'échelle mondiale. Ça, c'est très culturel. Ce qui fait notre rapport à la consommation, c'est très culturel. Il y a aussi notre rapport au territoire et, à la, et au local, euh, qui là aussi, évidemment, est un socle de ces gélules. C'est-à-dire qu'à la fois, nous avons un socle commun, nous avons des représentations collectives communes à l'échelle mondiale, euh, mais nous avons aussi beaucoup de spécificités. Et c'est aussi en s'appuyant sur ces spécificités qu'on forge des solutions locales par rapport à toutes ces crises-là. Donc, cette capacité euh, de, de, de maintenir et de mettre en avant la diversité du monde comme socle de solution ne doit pas être vue comme une contradiction par rapport au fait d'avoir des éléments culturels euh, communs à l'échelle planétaire, mais bien comme une synergie entre les, entre les deux niveaux. Et je crois que c'est ce qui nous, nous fonde euh, depuis toujours. Et je salue ceux qui, dans ce dans cet échange, sont porteurs de diversité depuis longtemps. Je vois notamment mon ami Jordi qui sera probablement en accord sur, sur ce point. Donc, moi, je pense qu'il faut qu'on raconte toute cette histoire-là, euh, y compris, il y aura des résistances. C'est quand il y a une part de tabou sur ces euh, questions-là, que les fils qu'on tire derrière sont aussi des fils sur la démocratie locale, dans la capacité de forger des solutions au niveau local, et c'est vraiment euh, dans, dans le socle des valeurs de, de ces GLU. Et ça nous fait donc beaucoup, beaucoup de questions. Alors, je, euh, une fois qu'on a dit tout ça, je ne sais pas comment, euh, comment on travaille, mais moi, je, je pense qu'il euh, il faut qu'on soit capable de, de mettre en table des tables rondes qui se posent ces questions de sobriété partagée, euh, d'une crise qui n'est plus tant une crise climatique qu'une crise de finitude, euh, qu'on tire tous ces fils-là. Et je pense que euh, ces GLU est vraiment un lieu très adapté pour toutes ces questions-là, et qu'il nous faudra aussi, c'est ce qu'on fait aussi beaucoup avec euh, Climate Change, euh, essayer de mettre en avant des, des solutions concrètes locales qui permettent de sortir d'un discours purement théorique pour l'illustrer euh, par, par des choses qui se passent sur le terrain. Et beaucoup de, de communautés locales, notamment, sont porteuses de, de solutions euh, très intéressantes et aussi souvent d'une vision culturelle peut-être plus, euh, euh, plus décalée, plus critique par rapport au mainstream euh, du, du monde tel qu'il est euh, aujourd'hui. Il faut donc les regarder avec euh, beaucoup d'attention. Voilà, je ne sais pas si avec ces propos-là, j'ai fait avancer le débat ou simplement j'ai ouvert des tas de pistes qu'il va être difficile de, de remplir. En tout cas, je suis très heureux de, de participer aujourd'hui. Et euh, pour les Européens, euh, j'indique que nous organiserons à Nantes euh, les 7 et 8 mars. C'est demain, mais euh, ça s'est organisé dans un temps très, très court dans le cadre de la présidence française de l'Union européenne, un nouveau sommet Climate Change Europe, cette fois-ci, en plus des sommets que nous organisons en Afrique, et le prochain sera à Dakar, début octobre pour l'Afrique. Et Jordi et Andrew, si vous voulez organiser un atelier sur ce thème à Nantes, les portes vous sont largement ouvertes, mais c'est simplement dans cinq semaines, donc c'est très très court, mais en tout cas, on est tout à fait à votre disposition pour vous permettre d'organiser un, un moment d'échange à Nantes dans le cadre du, du sommet Climate Change. Merci de votre attention. Thank you, Newman, for those remarks. These are already the recurring theme of the cultural dimensions of consumption, but also thank you for rooting it so squarely in climate justice and equity. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Kareem uh, LePage from the Global Alliance for the Rights of Humanity. And Kareem, if I could ask you to keep your remarks to seven or eight minutes at this point. Merci beaucoup de me donner la parole aujourd'hui. 
euh, tous mes voeux à tous et, et, et à toutes pour présenter l'initiative qui est celle euh, de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'humanité. Of the Universal Humanitarian Rights, which has been signed in Durban in November 2019. This is not new. I want to say that it has been inscribed dans euh, ce qui a été dit et plus particulièrement dans ce que Renan Dantec vient de dire quant à la responsabilité. En fait, euh, euh, la culture, c'est aussi, peut-être beaucoup, la manière dont nous, humains, nous représentons dans le monde dans lequel nous vivons, par rapport à ceux qui nous ont précédés, par rapport à ceux qui vont nous suivre et par rapport à l'environnement dans lequel nous vivons. Cela fait évidemment intégralement euh, partie de la, euh, de la culture. Et par conséquent, euh, nous avons réfléchi dans le cadre de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'humanité à la manière dont nous pourrions écrire un socle commun de principes qui ne touche pas seulement à, au climat, et je rejoins ce que là aussi Renan disait, euh, sur les limites planétaires. Car lorsqu'on parle de l'humanité, on ne parle pas que du climat. Euh, et de son devenir. On parle aussi, bien sûr, de la biodiversité, on parle des biens communs, on parle de l'accès aux ressources, on parle du progrès technologique, qui est quelque chose d'extrêmement important. On parlait de la sobriété, euh, le, le, le sens dans lequel nous investissons en matière de recherche-développement, qui est vraiment très, c'est certes dans le domaine économique, mais c'est également très proche du domaine culturel, euh, va bien entendu profondément influer sur les choix collectifs que nous serons amenés à faire dans les années euh, qui viennent. Et donc, il nous a paru important de disposer d'un texte simple qui fixe des principes euh, aisément compréhensibles, mais euh, facilement euh, malléables au regard des différentes cultures dans le monde pour fixer ce que devaient être les droits et les devoirs de l'humanité. Et euh, c'est ça le sujet qui permet précisément de répondre à ces questions de responsabilité à la fois dans le temps et euh, toute euh, le, la base effectivement de euh, la répartition des responsabilités sur le plan climatique, mais pas que, et dans l'espace. Parce que la question de l'équité intergénérationnelle est un sujet absolument majeur dont on voit que certaines juridictions commencent à s'emparer comme la Cour constitutionnelle de Karlsruhe, par exemple, dans l'arrêt qui a été rendu à propos de la loi climatique allemande, qui a été censurée précisément parce que le droit des générations futures n'y était pas suffisamment euh, pris en compte et respecté. Donc, euh, l'intérêt de la déclaration, c'est précisément d'essayer de mettre ensemble tous ces facteurs qui sont si différents, mais qui tous fixent les règles euh, du jeu, si je puis dire, pour un avenir possible de l'humanité. C'est bien de cela dont il s'agit, de l'humanité et du vivant, l'humanité ayant la responsabilité du vivant. C'est finalement ce qui fait notre grande particularité par rapport au vivant non humain. C'est la responsabilité et le sens de la responsabilité que nous avons du devenir du vivant non humain. Et euh, tout cela est à la base, effectivement, de la Déclaration universelle des, des droits de l'humanité, qui est un texte euh, dont la société civile s'est emparée, à commencer par euh, CGLU, mais aussi euh, le monde économique, le monde des ONG, les universités. C'est un texte qui monte par la base, et c'est cela euh, qui est finalement intéressant et qui en fait probablement sa richesse. C'est toutes les interprétations qui peuvent aujourd'hui en être données, parce qu'on commence à en avoir beaucoup, euh, de ce que cela peut signifier et de la manière dont cela peut être utilisé dans le sens précisément euh, du, du progrès collectif que nous avons à faire, des changements d'imaginaire que nous avons collectivement à faire, dans lequel s'inscrit effectivement la sobriété euh, dont il a été question, mais aussi cette utopie du meilleur que nous avons en, en nous, hein, d'essayer de léguer un monde meilleur, d'essayer de faire en sorte que nos enfants vivent mieux que nous n'avons vécu nous, etc., etc., comme le disait le philosophe Steiner, de laisser la maison plus belle en sortant que nous ne l'avons trouvée en entrant. Je vous remercie. Thank you so much, Karine, and um, thank you for 
pushing us to the Declaration of the Rights of Humanity, for, also for underscoring another dimension of equity, which is intergenerational equity, and for reminding us of the linkages between the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Um, and also thank you for coming in right on time. Much appreciated. I think now I'm meant to go to Amanado Gambo. Is, but is Amanado with us in the moment? I don't know if I see him. Um, Amanado, are you here? Um, okay, well, why don't we move on and then and come back if possible. And I'll move next to uh, Sanjaya um, Bhatia, who is the head of uh, office in Incheon for uh, UNDRR. Uh, uh, Sanjaya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. And, and thank you, Amelia and colleagues um, uh, from UCLG for this opportunity to participate in the town hall process. Uh, I, I, I would like to focus on a very uh, small area of culture culture is, is is such a is such a big and diverse topic so taking from the definition of culture that culture is the acquired knowledge people use to interpret experience and generate behavior so when we talk about culture and climate climate change what we are trying to do is change uh, the way people interpret experiences and the way people behave and uh, and a changed thinking, um, which also links the past, the present, and the future, the generations, because a lot of the culture is coming from the past. The present is modifying that uh, and creating new uh, facets of the culture. Uh, but it's the future, the future generations, which have to. Um, uh, deal with, uh, as we were, uh, was mentioned earlier, the, the, the responsibilities of the decisions that have been taken now. So how can we bring about a culture of, of, of uh, risk reduction? So one of the, one of the tools uh, which uh, cities uh, around the world are working with is, uh, is the Sendai framework for uh, reducing the disaster risks. Uh, but what we need is, is the localization of that. So it's uh, the implementation has been very much national driven, national government driven. Uh, but over the years, uh, and especially uh, where I come from, we, we are uh, coordinating a global initiative called the Making Cities Resilient 2030, uh, along with UCLG and other partners. The objective is to localize uh, this this risk reduction uh, in into the local governments and and further into the communities. So so when we talk about uh, culture, one of the important impacts of culture is that sometimes there is a culture of fatalism, um, a disaster, uh, be it uh, be it a flood, be it a cyclone, uh, a hurricane, um, or uh, anything induced by climate change, it, it, it is a test from God. So um, it, it needs to be uh, dealt with, uh, but without trying to look at uh, how can we actually reduce that risk or how can we change that trajectory. So we need to examine the history and how the past experiences of disasters were documented because uh, our, uh, uh, Roman mentioned uh, about uh, mythology, and and there uh, there is no mythology without disasters. It's there in every every uh, region of the world. So, how are these past experiences uh, documented? What what has impacted the narration of of those disasters, and uh, and what is the how was the data collected uh, from the uh, from the event? So. Uh, and then see how it can be corrected if, if, if needed, or maybe there's things to learn from them. So we need to be aware of, of, of what's happening. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, when uh, the Boxing Day uh, tsunami, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami, you all know, and uh, it impacted uh, Banda Aceh in Indonesia maximum. 
there was an island just off Bandache, Simule. And there in that island, there was a tradition, a uh, 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 myth that uh, when the sea starts boiling, it means that the gods are unhappy and it's time for all the people to move to high ground. This, this myth, this, uh, this story, this tradition was going uh, coming down generation uh, from generation to generation. And when the, when, the, when the tsunami was about to hit that island, just before it hit Banda Ache, the sea receded. So it gives that um, feeling of, of, of the water boiling. And, and the people saw that and they all moved to higher ground. And they are all a fishing community. So they are all on, along the coast and they all moved to higher ground. Not a single person died from the, uh, from the tsunami. Uh, on, on the other hand, in Banda Ache, more than 200,000 people died. So, so again, um, uh, it's important to, to examine our culture, to examine where it came from, what, what, are, what we have in our history, what we have in our past, but also put it in context, see if, if, if um, some, some corrections are needed or if there's something we can learn from them. That brings me to the next point, which is um, a concept of telling live lessons. So, uh, and this also influences culture a lot. So we have uh, mythology, we have oral traditions, which have been passed uh, through thousands of years. We have uh, uh, tales, stories, all kinds of um, narration, which have impacted our culture. So in the past, some have survived. I'm sure many have not. We don't know of them. Uh, but how do we ensure that what we learn today and what we have learned in the recent past is passed on to the next generation? So there are very good examples uh, around the world. Um, for example, Kobe in Japan had an earthquake. Now, uh, it was quite a, a devastating earthquake. There was a lot of damage and a lot of lives lost. Uh, a few thousand lives were lost. And um, what they did was they, they, they did two uh, um, uh, mechanisms. They established two mechanisms to pass on the, the, the knowledge and the, the experience of the earthquake to the next generation because that earthquake might repeat in the next generation, not now. So when it does repeat, the people who have survived this earthquake will not be alive anymore. And uh, you know, everyone will have to again reinvent the wheel. So better to capture these lessons and pass them on. So what they do is, firstly, they established a museum, an earthquake museum, which tells the stories of, uh, of the survivors. It tells the story. So it's not, it's not a, only a science and technological museum. It's all about human uh, experiences, human stories, communities. Uh, and and uh, they even, uh, what they do is they bring, for example, a person who survived the earthquake was at that time 10 years old, today is now 25 or 30 years old, comes to the museum and talks to 10 year old children, uh, to class uh, school children who are 10 year old. So explains to them what that person felt when, when this happened. So this is a very good way of, of uh, kind of preserving our culture, I would say, or passing on um, uh, some of the facets of culture to the next generation. The other thing they do is uh, they have a festival, uh, a kind of memorial festival. So uh, there's a candlelight procession and, and some uh, exhibitions and so on on the day of the earthquake every year. So this is also again, to ensure that the children learn about what happened. Similarly, in, in Sichuan, in China, um, there is a, a, a town called Bechuan, which, which was totally destroyed by the earthquake. Uh, there are still buildings there, which, which are um, uh, tilted and, <clears throat> and fallen. And, and again, uh, the entire, uh, uh, half the population of that town died in that earthquake. So what they've done is they've converted the entire town into a museum. You walk through the town and the buildings are held up 
the way they, they tilted and they were falling. And people can walk through and uh, school children are brought there to, to see the power of nature and to understand that this is what can happen and, and then to also then to, to encourage them to think, you know, how can we avoid this? So passing on the experience uh, is, is very, very important. And uh, I think the local governments can play a very, very important role in this, uh, in, um, in changing, uh, firstly passing on the experience and then changing the way of thinking in, in, the, in, in the other generations. Uh, uh, or towards a culture of risk reduction. Now, again, when we, we talk about museums uh, or cultural uh, heritage, again, we need to build their own resilience also so that the, uh, they can reduce the impact of the disaster on that uh, structure. So there are many uh, tools available for uh, resilient uh, uh, museums. There are tools available for uh, as we saw even in, in COVID, uh, that uh, museums are opening, uh, reopening with, by limiting the number of people coming in and, and so on. So, so there are there are a number of, uh, of ways uh, that uh, this cultural heritage is handling uh, even uh, a situation like COVID. Um, then um, that uh, uh, coming uh, closer to the end now. So uh, we also need to, the cities can play a big role in helping museums contribute to this resilience building culture uh, around the world. And again, uh, this is something that uh, local governments can look at. Uh, apart from that, even in, the, um, in our MCR 2030 and other uh, uh, initiatives, there are various assessment methodologies available to, to look at uh, uh, the cultural heritage in the urban areas in the context of climate change and, um, and, and to uh, 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 provide remedial measures so that the, those cultural heritage can also be preserved uh, for the future. And last point, I would like to say that when uh, disaster does strike, uh, in spite of all the resilience actions, um, the reconstruction also needs to look at the cultural heritage. So there is a very good example, for example, in Nepal, where <clears throat> the uh, heritage reconstruction became a center point for mobilizing communities, for a mobilizing voluntary effort from the communities, but also from the institutions of those communities. And uh, this renewed the sense of uh, local pride uh, so the, the people considered the, the sites being reconstructed, not simply monuments for tourists to visit, but essential places uh, for public life, uh, for community gathering and so on. So I, it, I come to the end of, of uh, my intervention, focusing on a very niche area, uh, but I think this is something where the cities can play a very big role uh, to uh, increase the thinking uh, and, and change the behavior towards resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. And I, I, it's been a rich intervention. And, and one point you made uh, stands out to me in particular, and that is this question of scales that I think we will have to deal with. On the one hand, we understand that culture is relevant at a macro sense to determining consumption and production patterns, or, or as you highlighted, to uh, risk reduction and to uh, regulating and moderating how people recognize risk, values, narrative, storytelling, they address how do people understand risk. Uh, but at the same time, at another scale, uh, many cultural institutions and many local and regional governments are actually stewards of cultural assets and cultural resources. They operate museums and libraries, and they have a specific responsibility to manage those collections and institutions to address climate impact. And so how do we make the institutions, the collections, the objects, the museums that we operate more resilient to climate risks, even at the same time we're thinking about these uh, bigger questions of personal injury related. So thank you for all of that. Uh, now it's my pleasure to give the floor to, um, to Daniel Akinse. Uh, Daniel is an uh, African youth leader and is representing the youth caucus here today. Daniel, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone, um, for having me. My name is Daniel Akindiche, and I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria. I run an initiative that uses media and storytelling to advocate for climate and environmental sustainability. I'm a member of the Nigerian Climate Change Coalition, a research lead at the Independent Continental Youth Advisory Council on African Trade. And I'm also a member of the Youth African Leaders Initiative. I'm here to represent the Youth Caucus. The current international context is one that speaks of urgency, one that seeks creative ways to solve the mess we find ourselves in. Um, so when I say climate change, when I say climate, what comes to mind is urgency. We need to do something, we need to find a solution, and we must do it now. It's important to talk about climate and culture because culture is a powerful resource for addressing climate change impact, and its role as a resource for climate change mitigation and adaptation cannot be overemphasized. I believe cultural heritage, natural heritage, and creativity can all contribute to addressing the root causes of climate change because natural heritage sites are useful in helping to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Tackling climate change requires coordinated um, government actions and informed effort by individuals. You know, now, let me speak for young people. We are becoming more responsible and passionate about the environment, seeing the various harsh effects of climate change we have felt in the last 10 years. If the climate is changing, we young people also need to change our culture and our day-to-day -day activities, acting more consciously about the environment. African youth are now more aware of the implication of casually dropping plastic waste on our streets, roads, and sewages, and we now know the implication of illegally cutting down trees to wildlife. Youth are contributing their quotas through innovative solutions, advocacy programs, and behavioral change campaigns. We use elements such as um, dance, music, to advocate for a healthy environment. Uh, I was in Tanzania about um, two months ago, and I met a young guy who uses dance, who uses music to communicate and um, environmental sustainability to advocate for this. I mean, so more young people are beginning to become aware, and so they are doing a lot to help in the environment. Corporate organizations and manufacturing industries need to revisit their operational strategy and organizational culture to accommodate the use of renewable energy. We however understand that um, this is expensive, but we all need to make sacrifices. Um, so the speaker, one of the speakers who spoke before me talked about sacrificing things to ensure that you know, we get the results that we want. Um, current trends that I see or that we, we, we get to see in the international context includes cleanup programs. So we see ocean cleanups almost everywhere now. So when you go to Kenya, you see ocean cleanup programs. In Nigeria, we have a lot of them too. We have consultations, virtual and on-site consultations to creatively and collectively address issues regarding climate change. There's also creativity. I spoke about my trip to Tanzania. Um, and I, I still have a friend who is based in Uganda who uses um, leaves from banana trees to create war clocks. And so young people are you know, coming up to, with solutions to, to ensure environmental sustainability. Additionally, if we must leave this earth better than we met it, there is need that we make certain sacrifices and these sacrifices need to come from individuals and organizations. This includes activity, changing our daily activity, activities to see that we, are, we do something different. We travel um, less so that uh, we do not expose ourselves to pollution. And we need to recycle plastics. And if we must use at all, we need to re recycle the use of papers. And um, I'm going to the thoughts of young people from our car course. Um, before now, African culture doesn't allow young people to give their opinions on issues in the society. They are believed to be too young to have brilliant ideas, and this is the fact. But now it has changed. It is changing, and it has, I think it has changed. There is need for active inclusion and participation of young people in policy making and decision making on issues that relate to climate change and culture at local and international levels. They should also be considered, young people should be considered as important stakeholders in the implementation and ex execution of these policies, not just onlookers, because these youths are the ones with the energy and the ones who will be available in the next 40 years. There's need to channel more resources to reach young people in underserved remote communities in our various countries. Uh, most times when we develop advocacy strategies, we leave out people without access to technology or social media, forgetting that these people are more in numbers than the literate. People in remote villages and communities are the custodians of our culture. So when you come to Nigeria, if you really want to feel culture, you need to go to the remote villages. You need to go to our villages because that's where we have the culture. Government needs to build capacity of young people in order to improve their sources of livelihood. So you're telling people to change their ways. It means that you're telling them to change 
um, the kind of work they do to move into something else. So it of course means that you need to empower them to, to sustain their livelihood because they are leaving this to go into something else. They are, they, they are not sure, it's risky. So how sure are they going to, uh, how, how long or how are they going to continue to fend for their livelihood if you do not support them? I have two more points, which um, of course borders on needs to transform the way we relate to the environment and ourselves. That is, we need to create another culture which is highly interrelated with developing a caring system. We need to acknowledge our belonging to nature and start acting accordingly. My last point talks about the urgency on, on, on governments and big private sector players to invest in sustainable systems and innovations. We need to push for further regulations and accountable plans of actions to reach climate change. So I'm going to conclude with this. We need to start raising environmentally and culturally conscious children who in the next 20 years will become active youth who are passionate about environmental sustainability. And this can be done by providing quality education for them, which is the sustainable development goal for of the United Nations. It is a great tool to foster other SDGs, including the climate action. Thank you again for having me here and I'm happy to share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that strong call for making room and supporting the voices for that introduction to work across Africa. And I, I note also that I think in your intervention, you used the word urgency maybe four times and it's exactly the right word to stress. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna now move to the Feminist Caucus. And I had mentioned at the outset that we might hear from uh, Sarnjana Gupta, but I think in, indeed we will hear from uh, Sri Sopton. Uh, if I have that right, Sri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you very much to the team um, uh, at UCLG for inviting Huaru Commission to lead the Feminist Caucus. Um, for some of you who are not familiar um, with Huaru Commission, it is a woman-led social movement of grassroots groups from poor, urban, rural, and indigenous communities in 42 countries who work collectively uh, to transform um, and improve the living conditions, status, and quality of life of women, their families, and municipalities. And we work in partnership uh, with facilitating NGO, research, and um, training institution, um, local authorities, and other uh, development actors um, to, commi uh, to commit to accelerating grassroots women uh, empowerment and, and inclusive, just and resilient communities. Um, that is our the central uh, work uh, of our organization. Um, yeah, I hear a lot of, um, you know, many things have been covered by colleagues um, who spoke earlier. I think for, for us from the feminist movement, um, there are two basic types of culture that are of concern uh, to us. Uh, one is the material culture. I think um, um, uh, Andrew and uh, Aroma earlier also mentioned about that. The material culture, the physical things produced uh, by a society. I think we are now driven a lot by the material culture uh, that is that that seems to be like driving development that um, the definition of development uh, is to build 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 you know have something new 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 kind of thing you know um, yes with the advance of technology we have to change uh, many of our devices and you you come to think of how that actually relate to uh, culture uh, uh, sorry how how that relate to you know uh, our environment the impact to envi our environment the, that keep that we then keep extracting new things but you know the innovation about um, reusing material and all that has been quite lagging behind, yeah? Uh, so um, uh, this is something that also when we talk about the material culture, the physical things that produced by us, by the human being, um, I hear earlier that, you know, anything must start from us, from one person to change um, uh, to the whole society. Uh, so. 
with local government, uh, government in general, I think the policy that they have for development is very important. And, and that, you know, the relationship of how they balance, um, you know, making sure that whatever they do, do not have adverse impact on our culture, or at least now to stop, you know, some of the development uh, trends or um, development practices that has really shown being impact, um, have adverse impact on our climate. And that relates to learning, you know, what uh, Mr. Bhatia mentioned earlier as well, learning uh, from experience, learning from uh, disaster that have impacted us. And then there is the non-material culture, the intangible things produced by society. Um, that, that is as important as the material culture, but how do we connect these two? And for women, these two are very, uh, very important because when we talk about feminists, it's about gender equality, it's about women empowerment and who and how we um, make sure that you know, this is part of the development process. This is part of how we work together and how we uh, make sure that we preserve and we have the, the world that we want to leave behind for our uh, future generation. And um, Daniel mentioned about, you know, how we need to educate our children um, who are going to be the future generation who will hopefully preserve our, um, our, 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 our environment and therefore, you know, uh, make, that, uh, make sure that we don't have um, that climate, the, the, the doom um, vision that, you know, the climate change will have on us. But to educate them, I think that have to start with us who are here today. How do we, you know, walk the talk? And um, for, for Huayru Commission work with grassroots, organized grassroots group. And they, you know, are groups in, in, in Kenya, groups in um, the Philippines, they have uh, practices that, for example, not using fertilizer, you know, that is um, uh, uh, raising, you know, um, their, their, even their chi uh, chicken and all that, you know, from not feed that is being forced to you by big um, multi, um, multinational. You know, how do we reconcile this and how do we make sure that, you know, that practices that they have and the knowledge that they have to come up with natural organic feed natural organic fertilizer, I mean, not fertilizer, but you know, something that, you know, to make uh, the soil, you know, uh, still productive and all that is actually the practice that we support, that the practice that the government, um, local government give funding for that, or, um, you know, uh, give the space and things like that. So um, I think for this particular, um, policy paper or network, um, this networking, not networking, town hall process. I think that part of the um, cultural heritage, uh, the, the way people used to do, how they build their building and all that, and the um, knowledge that women have um, that may have been belittled by development process need to be brought back and need to be um, accepted and relearned and look at those, um, the people who have that as expert, even though they may not have the PhD, you know, the, 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 the certificate and so on. So I um, would like to uh, say that we will join you uh, in this uh, process. Uh, and make sure that um, we work together to have that feminist perspective um, that no one will be left behind 
uh, in this uh, policy paper. Thank you. Hey, th thank you, Sri, and, and thank you to the Huayru Commission for representing the Feminist Caucus here today and, and to being a part of this town hall process. Um, for our uh, final speaker representing the um, members and caucuses of the town hall, uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Victor Pineda and Victor uh, who will be representing the Accessibility Caucus. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really, again, an honor to be part of this discussion, uh, I bring to the table a very important sectional uh, dimension that I want to uh, ensure is part of the cultural transformation. And that is the understanding that the human condition uh, is calling on us to create these cultural shifts across the board. Uh, climate is a transformation moment for humanity, but in that transformation, we have a choice to make, which is do we learn from our past mistakes and accelerate things that we know have empowered people, or do we rush into the transformation and continue to leave people behind? So in the Accessibility Caucus, our role is to coordinate amongst various networks that have seen and fought for accessibility, not only from a standards perspective, but from a social change transformation. Accessibility isn't just a legal mandate, but also an opportunity to unlock human potential, an opportunity to bring people into productive life, into social life. So as we think about accessibility, uh, we understand it not only from the perspective of ramps, but also from the perspective of uh, digital technologies and opportunities to identify and eliminate barriers. With trillions of dollars going into climate, infrastructure with incredibly large investments in zero carbon transportation systems, with comprehensive master plans, creating public parks and green zones, the retrofitting of buildings, um, local governments and uh, other stakeholders have both the responsibility as well as the opportunity to engage communities that haven't usually been engaged in the municipal movement or in local get level governance or in larger planning efforts. And those communities include older persons, persons with disabilities, migrants, indigenous communities, uh, gender and, uh, and, and feminist communities, all that benefit from accessibility. Now you might wonder, you know, how would it, uh, a migrant benefit from accessibility? Well, accessibility in this particular meeting uh, is that we have captions. We have sign language, uh, we have a language interpretation. These are accessibility features that unlock the capacity to participate. If you look at uh, the built infrastructure, accessibility features allow for a kid-friendly, age-friendly city, right? And so my hope is that the climate uh, cultural transformation is an inclusive climate and cultural transformation. But the stories we tell about the climate champions represent the diversity of humans that also are able to champion this transformation because we collectively have chosen accessibility as a central pillar and a cross-cutting theme across the climate and cultural moment that we are facing. Um, globally, there's over a billion people in the world that live with disabilities, 25% of 
people that live in cities experience barriers due to age or disability, the number of people with disabilities living in cities in the near future um, is because of urbanization, demographic changes, is expected to lever, to double to nearly a billion people by 2050. We're also looking at uh, massive changes in terms of demographics, aging. So again, whether it's autonomous vehicles and climate change and, and electric vehicles being put on the road to lower emissions, whether it's uh, these large policy discussions, such as the COP26, where we saw the energy minister of Israel unable to participate because the COP26 did not incorporate a simple questionnaire. Do you require accessibility or accommodations to participate equally in the COP26 discussions? The mere fact that question wasn't asked created a huge barrier and embarrassment for um, the host country. So I, I, I don't want to add, I would like to ensure that our members listening today don't see accessibility, that can see accessibility as a multiplier of good and a facilitator for participation and not think of these as competing interests, but actually synergistic interests that really unlock the potential of the cultural transformation climate movement and empowers local governments to show up without leaving anyone behind. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for that. Yeah, indeed, it would, it would be a tragedy, unfathomable, if we spent trillions of dollars on green transformation, ended up with a society no more accessible, inclusive, equitable than we started with. And, and, and here we get to the issue of people centered approaches and the cultural voice in that. But also thank you for reminding us of the need for our own processes, for climate policy making processes to be accessible and inclusive. And so now we come to the end of this segment of the program. There are eight uh, members and caucuses that make up the team to take forward uh, the culture and climate town hall. And, and you've met all of them, uh, save for our colleagues at the International Indigenous Women's Forum, who you'll meet another day. And so it's really been a pleasure. Um, and so really to get to hear from each of you a little more. We, we have a little bit of time for an open uh, forum to hear reactions on, on what we've heard already. And maybe in this moment, it would be nice to go back to, to Aramar, to Aramar Revy. Aramar, you, you began by making some provocations. And I, I wonder if, if you have any further reflections based on what you heard or did, did not hear uh, just now. Thank you. That was a very useful and wide ranging set of reflections, but just a quick, quick couple of sort of reflections. The first one is, you know, the science tells us that we need to act urgently, that we need to basically bring all of four or five transformations together, the energy transition, uh, which is kind of doing moderately well in some parts of the world and not so others, the industrial transition that's not doing well at all. And that's very important for cities because our cities are being built in many parts of the world. And if you continue to build them with the old uh, brick and concrete and steel and cement, we're going to be in deep trouble. So that's about the material reality. So that, that transition is not working well. Uh, we're not doing very, very well on what we call the oceans and uh, the land ecosystems transition. I mentioned that earlier saying that if you're going to hit 2.5 or three, we're all going to be in deep trouble because cities don't produce the food, the water, the other critical things that are required as far as that's concerned. Uh, but very critically, uh, what will determine a lot of the future, both on the emission side and certainly on adaptation is what we call the urban and, and, and infrastructure transition. And that is I think the area that we have to do the most about, and we have the greatest responsibility and capacity within, uh, within local governments. The challenge is, and we started this, uh, this discussion with that, is the imaginaries that we have, the imagination that we have, are all 19th and 20th century imaginations that are based on the concentration of fossil energy, fossil water, and I would say fossil forms of governance. Fine. And I think that is the thing that we really need to 
pushed back on because it is those imaginaries. And we've seen in COVID lots of fantastic examples from across the world, especially uh, with local and regional governments of trying to really transform that to you know, deal with sort of core questions. But I'm saying the science gives you all of this, but what the science doesn't give us is how do we address these questions in a just, in an equitable manner and an accessible manner. And I think that is really where, uh, these, are, these are questions of ethics and culture, which humanity has dealt with for 5,000 years or more. Uh, these are legitimate sort of areas of engagement, but they're not a central part of the discussion that often happens around climate, which is like I said earlier about efficiency, about consumption, about economic incentives, which are important. I'm not saying that they're not important, but there are other deeper and I think much more central things that need to be picked up and, and run with. And I think being able to get these conversations running and aggregated um, across the world in different contexts will give us a much better handle on how to deal with these questions. Uh, and I think that's what I hope will, will happen as we start bringing uh, these communities together and giving privilege to uh, questions of equity, uh, justice, and something we don't want to talk about very much. And that is a question of solidarity or fraternity, because that is the basis uh, around which I think uh, we have at least some hope of being able to achieve something in the next uh, you know, 10 or 20 years. And that's about as much as we have before things really start becoming very difficult for us. So thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I really hope that we're able to take this discussion further. Thank you, Armand. And I, I like the way you, you put it using the word privilege, that it, will this town hall be a forum where in the climate context, uh, issues of culture, people, justice, equity are privileged. Um, as they are not in so many other kind of policy making contexts. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we, we have uh, with us a, a host of, of, um, of colleagues with the interesting perspectives who haven't had a chance to speak. And so maybe I will ask one or two of the, them who have been listening to us the past hour, if they uh, would care to share uh, an intervention. And if I may, I'd like to go um, to two colleagues to uh, Gisela Chala and to Camilla Cochina um, and invite them if, if they would like to make interventions. And if I could, uh, could I start with you, uh, Gisela? And, uh, Un saludo fraterno. Un saludo fraterno desde Quito, Ecuador. Buenas tardes, ya. Eh, quisiera colocar algunos elementos frente a todo lo, y felicitar a cada uno de los compañeros que han podido intervenir y han colocado elementos importantes, quizás precisar de cómo se puede vincular la cultura eh, con este proceso de transformación y de cambio. La cultura para el pueblo afroecuatoriano, para los pueblos y nacionalidades ha sido símbolo de resistencia, resistencia frente a la opresión, frente a los oprimidos, y aunque, an, aunque antes históricamente eran cadenas físicas, hoy siguen existiendo diversidad de formas de opresión. Por lo tanto, creo que coincido con quien había, me había antecedido la palabra, es fortalecer la solidaridad, la ancestralidad, es decir, volver a los saberes de los pueblos originarios, la solidaridad, el evidenciar la necesidad de fortalecer agendas mucho más fuertes porque la preocupación del cambio climático con esto cierro está en los ámbitos internacionales, pero necesitamos fortalecer desde el movimiento municipalista prácticas y compromisos que generen transformaciones reales con voluntades políticas en la planificación y también en el presupuesto. Esta transformación social no se va a poder hacer desde la suscripción nada más de acuerdos como lo hacen algunos gobiernos, sino más bien con voluntades y acciones. Y para eso necesitamos construir la filosofía del Ubuntu. Yo existo porque tú existes para salvar el planeta. Gracias. Un abrazo. Thank you, Gisela, for that and for underscoring solidarity. And uh, on a personal note, uh, in my organization, the Climate Heritage Network, the city government, the municipal government of Quito, holds the co chairship for our Latin America region. And so I always feel happy when I'm uh, in a meeting with colleagues from Quito. Um, and now uh, let me ask um, an another colleague, uh, Camila Cochina, if she would like to make an intervention. Camila, are you with us? Yeah, thank you, and, and thank you everyone for super interesting interventions. 
So I'm a researcher at uh, University College London, and we have been working over the last 18 months with the colleagues from UCLG Research in the preparation of the next gold report that is going to be focusing on questions of pathways to urban and territorial equality. And we are trying to come and uh, participate as much as possible in the town hall process because we see that there are so many synergies and so many overlaps and so many interesting learnings that we can hopefully share and discuss with you. Um, so just a bit of background, like what we are doing in the next gold report is that we are um, discussing pathways to urban territorial equality uh, around a series of themes or pathways um, that uh, we have named common in, caring, connecting, renaturing, prospering and democratizing that as you can see they have lots of overlaps with the work that uh, we have been discussing here. And particularly, I want to refer just two or three things from the renaturing chapter that have, um, has, um, have emerged over the last few months that I think are so well connected with the discussions of culture and, and, and climate that we have been held in today. Um, this is a, a chapter that has been produced by Adriana and Mark Swilling and Isabel Avilovsky. Um, so basically this, this new social contract, this, this pact for the future that Emilia was referring, requires a reframing of the relation between urban and natural systems. And the, the idea of renaturing it comes as a, as, a, as a shortcut to discuss about how that, that relationship between those two systems uh, um, is reframed and it's reframed in economic, in social, but also in cultural, in cultural terms. Um, so basically, uh, in order to advance urban equality and to advance like a, a different future, we need to um, re-embed the relationship between urban and natural systems in ways that restore the, the vitality of both. And that has to do uh, has to be done supporting the needs and identities of historically marginalized groups and long-term inequalities and respecting local livelihoods and cultural trajectories. And those oppressions that, that Gisela was referring to are exactly, a, 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 I think, connected to, to that kind of uh, reframe that we need to do. Um, and as I was saying, I think it, um, the responses need to be locally grounded. And, and in a way, what the report is trying to do, the goal report, is to find ways, ways in which local and regional governments have actually space and opportunities in their hands to actually have a leading role in advancing these different uh, agendas, because uh, we know that this is a is a is, is a task that is is at stake at many scales, and local and regional governments have only one part of playing it, but a very very important one um, in uh, issues of of uh, breaking path dependency and locking trajectories of decarbonization, environmental degradation, exploitation, and also that urban infrastructure transition that Ari was referring to, um, but also with very concrete um, promotion of of, of of the of the of the things that local and regional governments do all the time, you know, in terms of uh, protecting communities of displacement from processes of gentrification and supporting concrete experiences from civil society that may be small but actually radical in their approach in relationship with nature, uh, uh, and also through functions such as energy, such as the waste recycling, transport. There are so many ways in which local regional governments can actually support these different trajectories, and I think uh, hopefully the goal report will, will offer like a repertoire of different experiences that we can look at and understand and learn from them in order to, 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 to have that kind of big imagination uh, with this massive task that is at stake when it's about climate and culture. So thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing some of this. Great, thank, thank you so much. You know, of course, our town hall is one of four, but uh, I'm struck how many of the topics we want to discuss in our town hall would equally be at home in say the town hall on global commons or the one on caring systems. So um, th thank you um, for, for reminding us of that transversality. And I'm glad, you know, and I'm glad there are some mechanisms to uh, allow us to, to keep connection to um, across, across these um, systems. Um, there was one uh, um, preparatory meeting to this one that I participated in with the um, leaders of the various town halls, and that uh, meeting was facilitated by um, by uh, Luca Bergamo from Rome. Uh, and so, Luca, since you facilitated the preceding meeting where all the town halls were together, uh, I wonder. And on this note of sort of transversality and, and interconnection of all these things. I wonder if I could uh, ask you if you have any thoughts for um, this group as we uh, strike out on our culture and climate time. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay. Um, 
Right, I mean, just a very few considerations. The conversation has been extremely interesting. Uh, and why, as it, as it has to be, in my view, uh, I would put it this way. Um, un unless we embrace a culture of sustainability or I was interested in this notion of la culture de la souveraineté because it is uh, it hits with something that is deep, and the idea uh, we've been you know running after consumption, compulsive consumption for for decades that has to be challenged. But and therefore uh, brings to the table the the fact that economy itself is part of the culture. So it's not culture and economy, it's not culture and this. The economy and the theory economy are a culture. So unless we, we as human beings, uh, somehow we embrace uh, a different perception or set of values uh, that fit with the idea that there is a right to the future for all the human beings and other life forms in the planet. Uh, sustainability itself is impossible. I mean, sustainability, it will be a result or a better balanced way of uh, uh, you know, living the planet. It will be the result of people behavior which might be partially informed and influenced by you know, uh, global decision-making, uh, national decision-making, but that as well is resulting from political processes, constituencies, movements, and so on. So I hardly believe that <clears throat> any serious conversation around uh, moving for sustainability Make sense if the culture issues at is at its core. This is, this is the culture is as someone would say is how we do transform perception into meaning and values, and it's a full set of tools that are as well uh, embodied in artifacts in structures that enable us to interact with the reality and the reality being uh, our even our inner reality. So to this end, <clears throat> I think that you know, the contribution that the town hall uh, should provide to the, you know, to the globe, to the, all this discussion leading to the <clears throat> Pact for the Future has to somehow uh, enforce that kind of approach, which has been to me, quite uh, positively impressing in, in, in the current conversation. Uh, so it's not culture and the arts. It's the role that culture has in shaping society uh, in, 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 the, in wide terms. That I want just to add one point that I consider uh, crucial because it's the, it's the how, okay, somehow. And we, I always treasured the, the human rights perspective to, to cultural life. And within that, the particular statement, which was uh, framed in the Universal Declaration, uh, where it says that everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community. Because that, that, that wording somehow includes things that are essential for what I was saying before, because it's the, free, the freedom is the community, which means but could, the cultural life of the community that implies a social dimension, a social bond that is related to participating in cultural life, the existence of a community and the meaning of that. So to this extent, that impacts massively as well in to the way the local authorities uh, 
do define their own role in allowing the people to overcome the barrier to their full participation in cultural life. Because, you know, the, what has been said during the conversation with regard uh, to the, you know, to the big things, to the big role that culture has in, then it has to be transformed into policies at level of the local authorities with all the differences that uh, necessarily comes in the different cultures. So uh, I, I think that the way uh, you have pitched this conversation makes this town all extremely well placed in order to be, to connect and be transversal to the, to the, to the general conversation for, uh, le leading to the back for the future. I think that uh, in further steps, we should be able to, uh, let's say, somehow bring to the ground to hurt cultural policy certain dimension. This is a political, very strong political statement, uh, but we should also add some, uh, you know, sampling of that, the implication of political statement, because they are extremely wide, and I agree 100%, and my, I'm deeply convinced that adopting this perspective, it really changes the ways you even do urban planning in cities or you define mobility uh, systems. But that is, is not the angle that normally local authority takes when uh, the topics come to their attention. So th there is some kind of bridges uh, that need to be done. Anyway, I, I was not expected to take the floor. So <laughs> I just really, want to thank you very much for uh, you know the opportunity of listening yes it was uh, you know interesting and refreshing in you know in a world where debates are normally <clears throat> frantic and meaningless uh, this one well, on the contrary was uh, really really worthy to be listened thank you andrew and thank you media for making it up happen got that Thank you, Luca. Well, so uh, I'm mindful that we're sort of over our scheduled time for this segment, but at the same time, I, I feel like we've just gotten started. And so maybe I will need to look to Amelia and colleagues to find if we should conclude this session or if we can keep or, or not. Well, I, I think it's a little bit up to us, Andrew. Um, I, I think that we have kind of covered um, uh, the different missions that we have in, in this virtual uh, room and that we have a lot of food for thought. What I would like to, uh, to invite you to do is to think about the next steps maybe, unless there are urgencies about ideas that we feel we, we, we have left um, unsaid. Um, and, and, and I suggest, Andrew, that, that I look at the participants and if there are any hands raised, then we, we can address that. But what I suggest now is to focus a little bit on, on the next steps. How do they, uh, how do they look like? Um, from the perspective of, of the World Secretariat of United Cities and Local Governments, of course, we, we are trusting on on Andrew uh, to guide a little bit the discussions among yourselves. We are going to open a mailing uh, list where you are able to talk with each other, but also this virtual space, UCLG meets, that is ready, that is going to be ready any minute now. We are waiting to open with the outcomes of all the discussions of the town halls. The last one um, is tomorrow. Uh, in that space, we are going to have uh, reference documents, we are going to have the uh, reports of the meetings, uh, the, the detailed minutes that Kathy always shares with us, but also um, uh, some uh, key messages or, uh, and, 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 um, and priorities identified by Global CAD. Uh, which is uh, accompanying us uh, uh, in, in this process. Um, and we invite you to, uh, to decide whether you need additional meetings uh, in, in the coming weeks uh, and days. Our next uh, uh, important stop is our retreat. Um, the retreat of UCLG is taking place from the 21st 
to the 25th of February here in Barcelona. It, it, it is hybrid, so there will be the morning segment is in person and the uh, afternoon segment is, is hybrid, so online participation is possible. And we have made sure that there is a full day that we are going to dedicate to the town hall uh, process with a plenary session, a hybrid plenary session in the afternoon where all the town halls will meet. And we will have then the opportunity to uh, have uh, many of you take the floor and share what you have heard in your respective town halls, but also to dedicate the session to these cross-cutting issues that are appearing in each of them and that we will need um, to, to further discuss and see how we approach them. Because um, in, in the different discussions that we have had up until now, um, there, is, there are issues of uh, uh, responsibility, truth, how do we relate to, um, to uh, science, for instance, the, the, the role of media in the way that we, perceive, uh, that we perceive the world, which we feel will be of interest to all the town halls. And we want to ensure that we uh, open up a space where you can uh, also exchange on, on these ideas, all of the town halls together. And we will take it from there and see whether um, there is a need to facilitate additional meetings. Um, as Victor was saying in the chat, the caucuses are uh, self-organizing as well, and they might be interested in, in discussing with some of you uh, certain topics. I think that you need to decide how you want to approach this conversation because I have identified a lot of common material that you have uh, that you can easily uh, agree about, but there might be a specific issues that we need a more in-depth um, debate about. Um, so, uh, Andrew, are there any are, is there anything that from your end you would like to, to share with, uh, with the members and the partners in this town hall at this point? Well, may, maybe I could ask a question. Um, if I understand well, uh, at the UCLG retreat at the end of February, we, we should uh, present a summary of the deliberations that, that this group has had. Is there any uh, particular format uh, for, for that presentation? Um, what kind of deliverable should we be trying to produce uh, in time for that retreat at the end of February? Okay, so we are finalizing this, uh, this session and we will discuss this with you. We will also inform in the UCLG meets how that would look like. Uh, give us a little bit of time uh, for this, just a couple of days. Uh, we only need to uh, do one more town hall and we will be ready to give you uh, that answer. But overall, I, I would say you define how you want to do this. Uh, you, you define what, what kind of inputs you want uh, to provide at that very moment. It's a space for co-creation. We don't want to predetermine how you work. Um, so uh, as, as long as, as it is meaningful and, and we see uh, and we see inputs that can really fit into the general discussion, we will be happy. I can, however, imagine that we will be asking for you to do a summary of key topics that you have identified as very significant, and we will then compare it with the mapping that we are doing on cross-cutting uh, topics uh, from all uh, the town halls. Um, but we will come back to you on, on that. Any other okay. questions uh, well, I, that you would I, I, I guess I, I would have, a, I'll put it to our group. Um, I mean, if we're meant to be able, uh, you know, in three weeks, at, um, February 22nd or so, to share a um, summary of the key themes and topics that we have collectively identified, uh, I, I guess I feel like it might be useful for us to try to meet once more um, before that date. So perhaps we could exchange um, ideas further by email, uh, but then maybe, uh, you know, something like um, the week, the uh, February 16th, 17th, somewhere around there, perhaps we could try to reconvene as a small group. Um, I don't know, just an idea. Um, but, I, yeah. but I leave it to the group. Yes, and, and especially also, to those who participated in the prior, the, the Durban processes, who know better than I what has worked in the past. 
Yeah, I think every single town hall was very different at that process. Um, I, I think that you can come very far with, uh, with some draft thoughts. Remember, we are going to have key messages coming out of here uh, that our friends from Global Cat are helping uh, are helping define. So once that we have that report, it might be useful for, for you also to have a look at it, Andrew, and define uh, some additional issues that you would like to see there. Share that with the rest on writing. I'm just mindful of the amount of time that you will all have, which is not that much to keep meeting. Uh, so I don't want to push you to have an additional meeting before before the retreat. I think the liberations on writing can go really far, but obviously you are more than welcome to uh, to come together again. So we're going to facilitate this email exchange and this space, uh, this interactive space in UCLG meets in a couple of days, literally a couple of days. Uh, we, we will have it ready by Wednesday, uh, I think, certainly. And then I invite you to to exchange and, and and to check with uh with your partners indeed if if an additional meeting is in the odds or or not um so i i just i just leave it there and it's 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 very much in your hands um indeed colleagues any additional questions or comments that you would like uh that you would like to to make andrew anything that you have forgotten to share or thoughts that you have no? Well, no, just just we'll we'll um, pick up by email and 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 need to have a continued rich conversation and engagement, and we can, um, as you say, we can um, take stock of how we feel we're progressing and coalescing around uh, those key messages in the coming days. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for taking on the, this task. Uh, we will certainly be in contact with you bilaterally if you have any doubts. Uh, colleague, do please feel free to send any ideas, including on process and methodologies that you might have. And um, we promise to have that interactive space ready very soon. I have seen it, it's already working. We just need to tweak a couple of things. Thank you all very, very much for being with us and for accompanying us uh, in, this, uh, in this process. Uh, we cannot do this without you. And we hope to see some of you, hopefully many of you also uh, here in, in Barcelona. Uh, if visa permits, we are going to do everything possible. And I'm looking at Daniel from the Youth Caucus. Uh, we, we are going to try very hard, Daniel, to get you to Barcelona. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, please keep safe, keep healthy and, and creative. Thank you, everybody.